I've eaten a commissary hamburger for lunch every day for 12 years. Oh no, those hamburgers are gone. All anyone wants is a good burger, but mergers, takeovers, team-ups, knockoffs, rip-offs, and the fast food wars force some of the top burger joints into early retirement. Here are 10 once popular burger chains that sadly died, part two. The commissary will continue to serve horrifying, artery-clogging hamburger. Yeah! Red Barn. It's a bomb! If you gotta go, you'd probably want to look your best on the way out, and that was certainly the case for this now-defunct burger chain and their big red barn. From McDonald's Golden Arches to White Castle's Snow White Fortresses and KFC's Red and White Stripes, there are plenty of fast food franchises that have capitalized on a specific and iconic look, and none of them might have been more eye-catching than the namesake exteriors of Red Barn restaurants. Founded in the farmlands of the Midwest in 1961, the chain country western theme, barn-style roof, and bright glass exteriors were instantly identifiable. In fact, the building design was copyrighted by ownership less than a year after opening for the exclusive use of its franchisees. And for a while, there were enough franchisees to start a cattle stampede. It's a stampede! At Red Barn's peak, it operated some 400 locations across 22 states and even yeehawed its way up into Canada. But regardless of how good the burgers were, the country bumpkin theme eventually wore out its welcome, and Red Barn was sold in 1983, having dwindled to only 100 restaurants. Down to only 22 locations across three states just three years later, Red Barn's Midwestern ways were finally put out to pasture in 1986. You can't do this to me. Burger Queen. If we pass a McDaniels or a Burger Queen, let's hop out. It's time to take down the patriarchy and dethrone the Burger King for a look at His Highness's once better half, the Burger Queen. The first Burger King opened in Florida in 1954 and predates Burger Queen's 1956 Florida founding by two years. So perhaps not being the older and wiser of the two is what eventually led to the chain's untimely demise. Expanding outward from Florida on the wings of the adorable mascot Queenie Bee, Burger Queen had over 120 franchises across Florida, Tennessee, Kentucky, and Indiana by the early 1970s. And by the time the calendars turned to the 1980s, the Queendom had expanded to over 170 restaurants in seven states. Excellent! However, a Game of Thrones-style Great War was on the horizon with Burger King's rapid national expansion, and this queen chose to distance itself from the royal brand before it was too late. All Burger Queen locations were renamed Druthers Restaurants in 1981, but kept the exact same menu that had made them successful. The franchise would once again ascend to a royal throne in 1990, though, agreeing to become a Dairy Queen franchise operator and converting all existing restaurants to Dairy Queen outlets by 1991. So, be it burger, dairy, or dragons, it seems the lesson here is you can't keep a good queen down. Dear God, we've killed the queen. Jerry's Hamburgers. We're worried about Jerry. Well, you're 39 years too late. If you've ever told a friend it was fine if they copied your homework but just changed it a little, then you'll understand this next burger chain that sadly <laughs> died. A steadfast regional chain in Wisconsin and Illinois, the first Jerry's Hamburgers location opened in 1960 on East State Street in Rockford, Illinois, and slowly grew to five stores by 1969 and 14 locations by 1972. First set up strictly for drive-in and takeout, business expanded with increased store size, eventually allowing for seating from 60 to up to 120 dining customers, depending on the location. Aside from the options of where you could eat, something else felt familiar about Jerry's success. Rumors abound even today that one of Jerry's original owners, perhaps even namesake Jerry herself, was a former executive at McDonald's. You're a double agent! It might have explained the large, not quite golden red archway that accompanied each restaurant, the maybe Mayor McCheese or cartoon cheeseburger mascot, and the tri-colored exteriors and tiled interiors that were eerily prevalent at Mickey D's at the time. Copycat or not, Jerry's just wasn't holding off the invading competition from the McDonald's juggernaut, and the company officially folded in 1981. We've got to wonder if imitation is still the sincerest form of flattery, even if it leads to failure. Failure, failure. First time here? Well then, welcome. Now go ahead and hit that subscribe button and never miss out. Thanks. You're the best! Ah!
doggy diner. What are those? Kind of looks like food. Speaking of failure, the sad demise of fast food favorites isn't exclusive to the burger bunch. And in this case, the end of this chain was the wrong kind of dog day afternoon. Founded in 1948 and peaking at 22 California-based and San Francisco-centered locations, Doggy Diner slung as many burgers as they did their namesake mm. hot dogs. In addition to three kinds of diner dogs and the classic fast food fries and malts, the diner menu featured the Big Burger for just 99 cents, a chili cheeseburger for only 90 cents, and a hamburger for a minuscule 70 cents. Take that, inflation! Impressive! Much like other quirky exteriors of its time, Doggy Diner grabbed people's attention with outlandish standout signage that featured a seven-foot-tall rotating head of a wiener dog wearing a chef's hat and a slightly quirky smirking smile. While the last of the litter passed on when the final Doggy Diner closed in 1986, the advertising became an enduring attraction to spot around the city for years after. San Francisco's last remaining dog head sign was even designated an official city landmark on August 11, 2006. Every dog has his day. Lums. Hot dogs, hot dogs, nice and hot! Here's another joint that specialized in hot dogs but dabbled in beef, and this one had a burger so good it ended up humiliating the hot dogs. Founded in Miami in 1956, Lums took off due to the concept of steaming their hot dogs in beer before serving them. But a local sandwich shop owner became the centerpiece of the operation in 1971 when Lums bought the rights to his hamburger. Lums purchased the secret recipe for what was known as the Ollie Burger from eccentric Miami restaurateur Ollie Gleichenhaus for no less than $1 million at the time, which is equal to over $7 million today. Times have changed, buddy. The Ollie Burger dwarfed the standard patties of the day by weighing in with a one-third pound ground beef patty that featured Ollie's secret homemade spices and homemade hot sauce topped with melted mozzarella. All 300 of Lum's locations introduced it, and just three years later, the Ollie Burger made up 20% of Lum's sales, while their steam shower dogs were only 6% of sales. With the demand for dogs officially down, the faltering flagship product caused Lum's to file for bankruptcy in 1982. Just one year later, the original Lum's location closed its doors, proving you should never send a hot dog to do a hamburger's job. There's no better sensation than having a little glizzy tickle the back of your throat! Winkies Burgers These burgers are outstanding! Some defunct fast food chains were gone in the blink of an eye, but in this case, one of them just gave us a wink. This Pennsylvania chain had humble roots that, at first, didn't involve cooking hamburgers at all. It did, however, sell the beef that eventually became patties. The Jiffy Steak Company was a Pennsylvania staple in the 1960s that sold raw beef products to customers across two dozen states. And when they noticed that the vast majority of their beef sales were going to a single McDonald's franchise in Virginia, it became apparent that that was where the money was being made. Beef. Saving both time and money by utilizing their own Jiffy Steak Company beef supply, Winkies officially entered the market in 1962. A basic hamburger at the time sold for 15 cents. But specialty offerings of beefy goodness included the Ground Rounder Burger, the Great One, and the Big Wink Burger. Winkies had more than a dozen locations by 1965 and had more than doubled that number by 1967. A decade later, there were more than 40 Winkies locations across three states, but the company went bankrupt due to an economic recession in 1982, and the winking eye of Winkies officially closed for good. Well, that, that sucks. Gino's Hamburgers Nothing beats a Gino's burger. Throughout restaurant history, partnerships and endorsements from athletes have become commonplace. NBA star Shaquille O'Neal was a slam dunk for Taco Bell, quarterback Peyton Manning paired up with Papa John's, and even tennis star Serena Williams has subbed in for Subway. But a much more unique occurrence is when the restaurant itself is founded by the actual athletes. In the case of Gino's Hamburgers, it started as a Baltimore staple way back before the Baltimore Colts left town, and nobody had even heard of the eventual Baltimore Ravens team that would replace them. Football. Football. 
football. The chain was founded in 1957, and star Baltimore Colts defensive player Gino Marchetti became the namesake for the restaurant after the team won back-to-back -back NFL championships in 1958 and 1959. Issues arose, though, when Gino's hamburgers tried to expand their territory to other markets, where other local football players were the big stars. And folks in those markets either had never heard of Gino or just plain didn't like the rival Colts team. In the fast food version of Fumbling the Football, Gino's cut their losses and sold the chain to the Marriott Hotel Corporation in 1982, with the last independent Gino's closing up shop just four years later. Fun while it lasted. Tops drive in. Use the Hardee's drive through, it's always empty. Just like the real life food chain, the fast food game can become survival of the fittest. For many defunct restaurants, they are inevitably swallowed up by the big burger on the block before the even bigger competition comes along to drive that chain out of business, too. Here's one burger chain that sadly died doing exactly that. Topps Drive-In had grown to almost 20 locations around the D.C. area after being founded in Virginia in 1953. Topps were indeed at the top of the game when it came to innovation, with a free drive through system called Teletrays that functioned as a drive-in with a speaker box, taking your order instead of a real-life attendant. That's awesome. The flagship product most ordered on those speakers was the Double Decker Sirloiner Burger, but it wasn't enough to fend off the double team of McDonald's and Burger King. By 1967, Topps was tackled by the fast food footballers from Geno's Hamburgers, and the 18 existing Topps drive-in locations merged into Geno's. However, as we've already seen, eventually even this passing attack wasn't enough to keep Geno's in the game any longer either. R.I.P. and cheerio! Wetsons. They're a little wet, they're a little wild. Between all the mergers, takeovers, team-ups, knockoffs, and rip-offs of the fast food wars, maybe the best strategy for survival was to try a little bit of everything. That was seemingly the case for Wetsons surviving as long as it did, with a decade and a half as perhaps the most prominent regional chain in the New York metropolitan area. Founder Herbert Wetson was inspired by a West Coast visit to the original McDonald's drive-in, and decided to take the burger concept to the opposite coast. Along the way, he picked up a few other ideas, too. His slogan, Buy a Bagful, was not so surprisingly similar to White Castle's Buy em by the Sack, and he adorned his drive-ins with neon orange loops backed by the apt slogan, Look for the Orange Loops, which was oddly similar to McDonald's Look for the Golden Arches. It looks very, uh... Similar. The Wetsons logo had a prominent W and an orange and white color scheme quite similar to Texas's Whataburger chain. And they even rolled out a pair of clown mascots that weren't all that dissimilar to Mickey D's Ronald McDonald. While being a little of everything, Wetsons perhaps failed to find enough of its own identity and permanently merged locations into the Nathan's Famous Hot Dogs chain in 1975. Good riddance. Honorable mention, the ESPN Zone. Your New York is an ESPN zone. Before we get to the final spot on our list, give this video a quick like as we look at an honorable mention that didn't make it to the end, or even the end zone. We've seen famous athletes founding restaurants and advertising for food chains, but this themed burger joint was catered specifically to the fans of those athletes. The sports-themed ESPN zone was a big part of the Disney buyout of the ABC broadcasting empire in 1996, but it took two years for the first location to open. But I want it now! The store was even Disney adjacent enough to include a restaurant at the Disneyland Resort in Anaheim. The menu was anchored by four different burger varieties. The cheeseburger, the turkey cheeseburger, the peppercorn turkey burger, and the signature ESPN burger. The restaurants themselves, though, weren't anchored enough in customer satisfaction to stay afloat. Over 20 years in business, ESPN zones would close one location as fast as they could open another one and never gained a foothold in the market. The final location closed in 2018, two decades after being founded. ESPN considers itself the worldwide leader in sports, and they probably should have stuck to baseball instead of burgers. Whoa, dude, you smell like beer. You look like beer. Royal Castle. Royal with you. As we saw with the Burger Queen royalty on this list, fast food franchises both alive and dead have no shortage of castles and crowns. Burger Queen, Burger King, Dairy Queen, and even a White Castle fit for queens and kings. Emerging from this hard-to-follow hodgepodge, 
montage of royalty and red meat is the last entry on our list, and yet another sadly dethroned monarch of the meat lover's market. An old school original, Royal Castle was founded in Miami in 1938. Perhaps deciding their signature sliders and birch beer root beer variant were a pretty good cure for the Great Depression. Ooh, root beer. Royal Castle's regal slogan declared its grub fit for a king, and enough customers were in agreement that the chain had nearly 200 restaurants at its peak in the late 1960s. The company eventually liquidated in 1975, forced to yield their kingdom to national expansion like so many other defunct fast food chains. A single remaining 24-hour Royal Castle is still open today on 79th Street in Miami, a defiant throwback holding its crown high in honor of these many once popular burger chains that sadly died. May they rest in peace. Craving another video? Just tap or click. First time here? Then leave us a comment, hit that subscribe button, and ring that notification bell.